I've made a little mess here on my screen, but I've gotten started on a web service program that can receive JSON information. You may or may not be familiar with JSON, which stands for JavaScript Object Notation, but what this is is a very simple way of passing data that's a lot more lightweight than XML. Here you can see an object's been passed. The first name is Mark, last name is Lassoff, company is Learn to Program, age is 36, which means I did this a couple years ago. Um, and here is the PHP that produces that. All it does is print the object, and this is the result you see here from the URL. We'll grab that URL because we're going to need that in a few minutes when we create our AJAX interaction. All right, so go ahead and close my console here. I've already created a application, and this time we're working with an iOS application that's called Process JSON. Let's go ahead and get to the stuff that we need here. So I'll go ahead and open up our uh, index.html. And that's what we're going to be working on. I'm going to clean it up here. I don't use the included style sheet for this. We'll change the title, although it has absolutely no effect, to process JSON. Take out everything here in the body except for the connection to Cordova. And I think we're ready to go. Okay, so let me move that to the head where I like it. So we're going to connect to the server. So we need some place to put that information. I'll create a div here with the ID result. And this will capture the information that comes back from the server and we'll go ahead and place it in this div that I just gave the ID to. So let's go ahead and set up some of our own scripts here. We've got the Cordova script attached. So I'm going to use the script tag and we're going to do the window onload here as I typically do. So we'll trap the onload event. We'll set that to an anonymous function. And that anonymous function, of course, will get ready for the device ready event. So the way we do that is we use documents. Make sure we spell it right. Add event listener. The event we're listening for is device ready. When device is ready, we're going to call init. And we'll set that last argument back to false. All right, and that's all we need for the Windows on or the window onload function, I should say. So now we need our init function. Now we can get the data on init, or we could get the data based on some other event. I think what I'll do this time is I'll add a button. Input type equals button, and we'll say value get data. That'll be written on the button. And we'll give this an ID of BTN get data. Now, of course, we're going to need to attach some type of event to the button. So let's go ahead here and let's do this in init. So documents, we're going to use get element by ID. And we're going to get that button element. I'm going to attach that add event listener. We're going to listen for click, and we're going to call the get data function. And again, I'll set the last argument to false. All right, so we have our basic structure here. So there's our get data function. So here in init, let's set up our XML HTTP request object, which should be global. So we'll declare it inside the script, but outside any particular function. And then here in init, we can go ahead and instantiate the object. So XML HTTP equals new XML HTTP request. We can also start to configure this. So we'll say XML HTTP and we'll call the on ready state change listener. And when there's a ready state change, we'll call the function uh, data return. 
And before I forget, let's go ahead and add the data return function, just the stub at this point, to our script. You may notice that I use copy and paste for these when I uh, name a function. The reason I do that is just one less place that I could possibly make a mistake. I'm not a very good typist, so I use copy and paste with references, and this way I write them the same way every time, at least when it's possible. All right, so here now we need to configure our XML HTTP request. So, so far this is exactly the same. Method's going to be get the URL. Oops, we had before. Let me grab that from our uh, browser. And, of course, you want to make doubly sure that that's correct. And we'll make this asynchronous. We'll also call the XML HTTP send method, which is going to actually send to the server. All right, so now, of course, anytime the ready state changes, we're going to call data return. So we've got to check two things. First of all, we need to check the ready state itself, that property. We're looking for a four, and we're looking for a status property, which is the HTTP status, to be 200. If we've got both of those, then we know we've got a good response. So now we're going to get the response in this JSON format. Remember, we looked at that at the beginning of this particular video. So to deal with it in the JSON format, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a variable called JSON response. And we'll go ahead and put that in a variable, or we'll assign that from XML HTTP, and we're going to use response text. There is no response JSON, which is kind of odd, because JSON, of course, is native to JavaScript being a JavaScript object. But what can you do? Now comes the funny part. We have to do a little bit of a hack here. On the JSON response, we've got to use eval. And we've got to evaluate the response. And what that does is it moves it from a string into an actual object and then reassigns it to the variable JSON response. So the way we do that for reasons, frankly, I'm not even aware of, is we put it in parentheses, then the original JSON response, and then a close parentheses. Now, for those of you who are less experienced coders, this may appear a little bit confusing. But remember, when you have an assignment operator like this, the right side of the assignment operator is always evaluated first. So we have the JSON response text right here, we concatenate that with the parentheses. We run the eval function on it, which gives us the object, and we return that object to JSON response. So essentially, we've made our original string response into the real JSON object. Now, you might remember that the JSON object actually had the first name, last name, company, and age. We could even grab that again and take a second look at it. Pull that over here. There we go. So the keys here are first name, last name, company, and age. And then our values are Mark, Lassoff, the company name, and 36. So we've got the key value pairs here. So now we've got to extract from the JSON response object the values of the pairs. So I think what I'll do is I'll create an output variable, just like that. And then we'll add to the output variable each of these properties. So output plus equals, and we'll say first name. And then we'll get from the JSON response object the first name property. Now you've got to be careful to make sure you capitalize, of course, the same way it is in the object itself. So then let's add to the output, better put a break in here. So first name, last name. There's only four pieces of information in this object. But you can see accessing it through the dot notation is very easy. And this is actually a lot easier to parse than the XML. The XML, we have to loop through it, etc. So this simple JSON object, much easier to parse and takes less time.
So then we have the company property, and the last one is the age property. Okay, so let's do this last one here. And again, this last one is going to be age. So the property comes from the JSON response object, age. Now we're going to put our output. Remember, I made that result div right here. So let's go ahead and put our output there. So document, get element by ID. The element is result. And we're going to set the inner HTML to that output we just created. So pretty easy to parse the JSON object and get the output. All right, let's go ahead and make sure everything's saved. And I'm going to boot up our uh, actual, oops, wrong folder. I'm going to boot up our project here inside of Xcode, and we'll take a look at the results in the iOS simulator. All right, there we've got our environment loaded and our actual uh, simulator popping up here. Let's go ahead and bring that up again. It likes to hide. Let's click the Get Data button. And it oh, looks like we got up, oh, forgot to add it to the whitelist. So let's go back and let's add this URL to the whitelist. I always forget that step, but it's an important one. So you remember here we can go into the actual application. And I always forget where this is. Let's see, resources. There it is, cordova.plist. And then just right here, where it says external hosts, we're going to add one by clicking the plus sign. And we're going to add that particular host, which is my temporary location for all of this data. We're going to save and close the plist. So that's the plist. And we can actually close the plist. And let's try it one more time. That's a very good error to get because it tells you exactly what's wrong. Okay, so we're running again. We'll go ahead and click Get Data.